Well, welcome to the 11th day. The theme for today is a guiding inner power. And our spiritual law from uh, Sir John Templeton is, the world abounds with meaningful stories of wondrous, wonderful connections between individuals and the divine. Of wondrous connections between individuals and the divine. Um, and so today I'd like to talk for a, a while, for a few minutes, about this, uh, this notion of an inner power, a guiding inner power. Um, if we take a moment and reflect upon that, we might ask ourselves what names we use in our cultural contexts for this idea. Is it an unfamiliar idea to us, the idea that we're guided, we can be guided from within? Um, in a, a modern and postmodern uh, context, the idea that we might have some sort of active inner presence within us that guides us might be dismissed as a, a kind of a, a superstition or, at best, the relic of an older understanding of life, which uh, people were thought to be irradiated somehow by thoughts or ideas or energy from a, a, an immaterial dimension, from, from the realm of spirit. And that idea hasn't had much validity in, in mainstream academic and scientific settings. And yet, it's an old idea, and old ideas have a way of not going away, but just coming back again. There, there's something about the notion of this guiding inner power that, that really has a lot of power. It, it really does tend to speak to us, because, uh, uh, because actually, this notion can be very helpful when we think of it in terms of a good, old-fashioned, durable, and sturdy word, the word conscience. What is conscience? Where does, from where does conscience derive? Um, this, this, uh, this question is, is one that uh, can bring together many different disciplines. Uh, from a contemporary perspective, conscience may be thought of as a kind of a, uh, as our socialization. Uh, in fact, we may even hear inner speech. It's not, uh, it's not merely pathological to hear voices. Um, because, after all, we often speak to ourselves or we may hear in our, uh, we, we, we may observe ourselves as we speak or interact, interact with others, and we may uh, chide ourselves or praise ourselves. We may even at times imagine that we hear the voice of a teacher or an old friend or a parent guiding us along. There's nothing about that that would be considered outside the pale of the ordinary for a, a contemporary psychology or for a contemporary moral philosophy. However, the notion of conscience has a much, much richer tradition than this, as will become clear by just listening for a moment to one of the great figures of conscience in Western philosophical tradition, Socrates, who wrote, um, Something to, he spoke of his own inner guiding power, a kind of inner monitor, an inner guide. He, he said um, in the Apology when he was giving his great self-defense at his trial, something divine and spiritual comes to me occasionally. The very thing which has been ridiculed in your indictment, he spoke to his accuser. I have had this from my childhood. It is a sort of voice that comes to me. And it doesn't come to tell me to do something. It always comes to tell me not to do something. When it comes, it always holds me back from what I'm thinking of doing, although it never urges me forward. So this idea is, is classical, it's ancient, and many of us have a common sense understanding of conscience, regardless of our academic or scientific backgrounds, that this is what conscience is. In fact, most of us probably work on a daily basis with some idea of conscience like this. A modern version of this, of this uh, inner uh, uh, guidance, is uh, comes from Steve Jobs. He needs no introduction. Who, in his uh, 2005 commencement address at Stanford University, famously said, "Do not, don't let." The noise of other people's opinions drown out your own inner voice. Don't let the noise of others drown out your own inner voice. So the notion of an inner voice, it's still there. It persists. And um, what I, I particularly like, a, a, more, a more modern, although not so recent, way of talking about this inner guiding power. Uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson, um, a great uh, 
person, a great figure in American literary history, one of the transcendentalists, and himself a kind of lapsed Unitarian minister, uh, was invited uh, in the early 1830s to give a talk at, to the graduating class at Harvard Divinity School. And this talk, the, the, the Divinity School address, I believe was about 1837, uh, went down in history. It was, no, it was no typical commencement address for a group of new ministers, uh, because one of the many and less controversial things that uh, Emerson said in this, in this talk, which got him banned for many decades from Harvard University, his alma mater, is he, he said to this class of uh, newly minted uh, ministers, "'Yourself, a newborn bard of the Holy Ghost, cast behind you all conformity and acquaint men at first hand with deity. Today, we might say, acquaint people at first hand with the divine. These words, these lapidary words, lapidary words that are worthy to be engraven in stone, today are to be found in the chapel uh, at the Harvard Divinity School, uh, on the pulpit where uh, Emerson perhaps stood and gave this talk. Yourself a newborn bard of the Holy Spirit. What a destiny that is, that there is within us a kind of divine speaking that can give us guidance. Uh, now, of course, it, it, it's odd. We live in very uh, limited uh, intellectual circumstances today, because although that can sound perhaps odd in a very secular context, there's really nothing much odd about it at all. Most religious traditions do have a strong and robust sense of a kind of divine guidance that helps us along our way. Uh, if we're, we were to look at uh, the, um, the, the literature of Catholic mysticism and Eastern Orthodox mysticism, we'd find a robust literature that describes uh, the inner guidance that, that uh, is available to those who watch and wait within. Um, and this, of course, can be found in, in, in other uh, spiritual literatures as well. Um, a few, uh, a couple of uh, other attempts to make sense of conscience um, can be found. Uh, a contemporary Buddhist teacher by the name of Bhante Sujato um, thinks of, uh, speak, refers to conscience as a, a kind of listening within to hear what? To hear from what? Well, in, in line with the Buddhist tradition and generally, to hear from our inner Buddha nature, because each one of us carries within us the, the mind of Buddha. We have planted within us the seed, the bodhicitta seed, the seed of enlightenment. And enlightenment on this school of, of Buddhism involves working for the welfare of all beings. And how can we make progress in that direction unless there is some kind of guidance? There's external guidance from teachers. There's external guidance from parents. But fundamentally, it's our own nature that guides us. This is an idea that's also found in Chinese thought with Mozart as well, the, the idea of the fundamental goodness of human beings. Well, what is this goodness if it's anything? more than just a word. Our own goodness guides us. And that is why in quiet moments and in difficult moments when decisions need to be made, when our, our values are on the line, it's often then in such moments that a, a kind of a stillness comes over us and a sense of rightness, a sense of correctness in what we need to do. And oddly enough, when the resolve rises within us to act in accordance with the dictates of conscience, there often comes a conviction, a sense of power, a sense of strength, and a sense of, of resolution that come what may, um, this is the right decision. That's a robust sense of conscience. And this is, of course, what Socrates had in mind. His was a, a more on the negative side. It didn't tell him what to do, but it held him back from doing things that he should not do. And so what becomes clear then in conclusion uh, of this very short discussion of conscience, it's, it's an idea, it's a thought that has come to me often over the years, and that is regardless of what our philosophy may be, regardless of what our worldview is, secular or non-secular, the fact is we remain obligated. We cannot evade obligation. We 
always find ourselves uh, accountable to some inner monitor that lets us know that in this case, we cannot evade our responsibility. We are always under obligation. And that for me, if nothing else remains of the traditional notion of conscience, it is the idea that we cannot evade the sense of obligation. Even I, I would have to blank out my consciousness, consciousness in order to evade that sense of obligation that is part of my life. And I know, use other words if you like, that the sense that, that this is what is right and that is not, is not, is something that cannot easily be rooted out of our consciousness.